uh, anterior cervical discectomy and infusion versus anterior cervical discectomy with disc replacement. Uh, kind of what the, the technology holds for us and what the future looks like, as I think this will be performed more and more as time goes on uh, regarding uh, the artificial disc replacements. Um, so I'll give you a short talk, give you some of the information regarding that. You'll be able to see it based on a couple videos that are in here. The differences, that the pretty significant differences of, of what the outcome is following a fusion versus motion sparing technology or using a disc replacement in order to maintain the motion at the, at the index level or the surgical level. Some of the questions in the previous uh, demonstration of the cadaver was about adjacent segment degeneration and you've got this really stiff segment. The levels above and below that have a little more work to do to compensate for it, so they have a tendency to wear out faster, roughly about 3% per year. And this is one of the reasons why this technology is being pursued um, significantly in the sense to avoid that risk of the additional stress on the levels above and below to try and prevent that adjacent segment degeneration or at least mitigate the, the effects from the surgery itself. All right. So surgical management, ACDF has been around for a long time. A long time. We've been doing this for many, many 50 years. This has been around, believe it or not. Um, it's a very familiar, successful procedure. The, the clinical outcomes are very good. The patients get relief as long as the indications are there and the appropriate, uh, and the appropriate uh, patient selection is, is, uh, has been identified. We do know that there are complications or there are drawbacks using ACDF. For instance, there's compensation for loss of motion at adjacent levels. Adjacent segment disease within 10 years, there are studies been shown it's approximately 3% per year incidence of adjacent segment degeneration. So again, you know, 10 years later, you have a 30% chance. 30 years later, you've got about a 90% chance. And that's, that's the, the level or the percentage of patients requiring surgery. Okay, that's not just patients who show wear and tear, but it's bad enough to the point where they're actually gonna need a secondary surgical procedure. You know, so we're trying to move away from this fusion technology and it's, it's tried and true, but it's, you know, it's day needs to come. Like we used to do hip, hip fusions, we used to do knee fusions for knee arthritis. Well, it would eliminate the patient's pain, but you can imagine how you're walking with a, you know, a knee fusion, you got a stiff leg or a hip fusion, right? You got a lot more work to do with your back. You got your gait's gonna be completely off balance. It's causing other issues and compensation effects in your, the rest of your skeleton, so you have problems with it. So degeneration reoperations, based on the studies that were uh, used comparing total disc replacement with ACDF, we know that there's increased range of motion or generation at adjacent levels with ACDF, means above and below the fusion, because these discs have more work to do because this one's not doing anything anymore, right? It's not moving. And then reoperations are two to six times higher with ACDF because we've lost motion at that level and it's causing issues. And typically, as you can imagine, if somebody's got a problem with a disc, it's probably not going to be just that disc. And typically as we get a little older in age, we have wear and tear other discs. So now you've got a spine that has multiple discs that move. And so they all kind of compensate one another and do okay. And you spread the, spread the responsibilities amongst all the levels of the cervical spine. And they all have a little wear and tear. And all of a sudden you take one of these out of the picture or take two out of the picture of these discs. Now the other remaining four discs now they have a lot more work to do. And they're already teetering on having some problems just because there's some wear and tear going on, right? So now you're gonna pushing that process over the edge and starts causing more problems down the line and then you have the subsequent surgeries that, that can happen afterwards. So the basic level of the study they did for artificial disc replacement, particularly for the implant that uh, I use, I think, which I think is the best one for multiple reasons. Uh, they did 600 patients. There were two patients that had an artificial disc for every one that was fused. And then looked at a primary endpoint of two years and eventually the, the approval came through in August of 2013. It was the first disc that was ever approved for use in two levels, not just one level, based on the success rates of the study. So I'll give you an idea of what this looks like, okay? This is going to show you what it looks like, range of motion of fusion versus artificial disc, and you can see the overlays of what the difference is going to look like. It's showing you that range of motion, what the endpoints are, flexion extension, then lateral bending. So the artificial disc with those units still moving, okay? Now we're gonna show what it looks like with a fusion. This is a plate with the implants in the middle. You see the difference now? This does not move at all. So this has to do more motion, so does this. It has to do more work, I should say. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. So you can see the difference. Thank <laughs> you. 
So now if you're trying to look at something, or particularly if you have a type of occupation where you have to use your neck a lot, driving heavy equipment, looking over your shoulder, you're going to be stressing those discs above and below this on a regular basis because those levels aren't moving anymore. Yeah, that's right. All right, so one and two level outcomes. So they looked at the studies two years later. One level outcome, MOBC is, uh, is the green here and the ACDF is the blue. So we're looking at what the degeneration was at 24 months, so two years later, right? So we have the artificial disc. This is the level below the implant, and this is the level above the implant. But you can see this 7.7% with a fusion, 21%. I mean, the numbers don't lie, right? 14.6 and 25%. So there's two to three times the rate of adjacent segment degeneration with the fusion. So it's pretty compelling evidence. Again, now looking at a two-level study, there's a, a pretty significant contrast. This is even a more marked uh, difference as far as the adjacent segment generation, generation with 3% inferior level, 13% above, compared to 33 and 18%. I mean, there's, it's even more dramatic as far as that, that difference is concerned, right? So the idea is we want to keep things moving. I mean, that's what orthopedics is all about, right? We want to keep people moving, keep functions, joints moving, keep the skeleton moving, because that's what it needs to do. When we're fusing it, we're trying to avoid pain or impression or impingement of neurologic structures to get those functions back, but we're sacrificing motion. We're trying to avoid that. This is, just, this is the surgeries within two years. So these are patients that had to go back in for another surgery. 0.6% incident, this is a one level, versus 3.7, and look at a two level, 0.9%, so not much of a difference, right? Goes up, to, so you see the difference here again, 3.8%. So this is in two years, patients going back. So one out of 25 are going back for another surgery. All right, it's a lot. This is from complication secondary sur surgeries, 6.2% versus 1.2, 11.4 versus 3.1, so significant differences again. You see the differences, so no sense to be that horse. You guys get the idea, right, as far as what the differences are here. So we look at one level success rates for an artificial disc versus a fusion. <clears throat> so secondary surgery success, so 98.8% of them did not require any secondary surgeries. And the one level study, so this is one level of artificial disc versus fusion versus a two level, okay? But looking at the success rate based on neck disability index, so ACDF is down to 61.8% versus 78. So definitely better in that regard. Again, they still have some degeneration going on. One level, not a lot of difference there. But when we start seeing a lot more of a, a difference or a contrast, start contrasting, you start seeing two levels. And overall trial success, 37.4% when you talk about a two level ACDF. So when you get up to two levels of ACDF and higher, the success rates tend to start dropping off. The more you fuse, the less moves, the more problems you're gonna have, okay? And then this is a pretty interesting uh, This is actually done uh, during sort of the live fluoroscopic view of how these things work. So that's after implantation. So you can see the disc, the end plates shifting over one another, the angulation changing, and the motion that's maintained there. So the reasons why this implant, I, I tend to choose this one. A couple of reasons. One, the implants themselves don't require any cutting into the bone, okay? They're kind of a press fit type of architecture. Uh, the, motion, the motion that's restored based on the, the way the mobile bearing is in the center, and I'll show you that in the implant here, and you guys have a model you can take a look at. Um, it tends to mimic the, the best center, centers of the adjustable center of rotation that's in the cervical spine, because as we bend our neck and move, the center of rotation, as something turns, it actually changes in the spine because there's some gliding and sliding, so that, that this technology is able to reproduce that in a better way without causing significant bone damage or causing any keels to be cut in the bone or screws being applied, because this, those things will typically loosen over time. So what we're looking for is we want the body to heal into this like it's its own disc. So that's on the back of this end plate there's a rough surface where the bone can grow into and stick to the implant, and so it becomes just part of the body. So there's no chances of it loosening and that type of thing after time once it's healed. <coughs> All right, so looking at the overall return to work, differences are pretty significant. So with you know one level study, two level study again, so patients going back to work, okay, 
if you're looking at level of study. So there's a difference of almost three weeks here with a two-level artificial disc. They're going to, week, going to work three weeks earlier because they're not, we're not having to wait for two things. One, the patient's going to be fused. We've got to wait for that fusion to happen and let that heal. So the patient's typically in a collar and immobilized. Well, while they're in there, they're getting stiff and rigid and also weakened. So, but we've got to wait for that foundation or that you know, foundation to dry or, or the cement to sort of cure before we can start building on it, right? Well, an artificial disc, you get them moving. We want them moving right away. So you're, you're basically eliminating a lot of that period of waiting for a fusion to heal by putting an artificial disc in there. So we can get patients moving right away and get them functioning back quicker so we don't have to deal with much of the stiffness and the weakness that comes from immobilizing them after fusion surgery. Any questions? What's the cost difference? They're about the same. About the same. Yeah, the implants as far as the surgery itself, not a lot of difference. Yeah, the, the, and less rehab. Yeah, typically, typically these patients aren't requiring, unless they have neurologic deficit, so then they're gonna need rehab for that particular problem. But from the standpoint of getting range of motion restored, usually we're not needing nearly as much, if any, rehab. And as far as re regaining strength in the neck, they're not, they really haven't been immobilized to the point where they've gotten weaker, so it saves quite a bit in that respect. Plus they're back to work sooner. So, and that helps a lot of different issues when it comes to, you know, the mental aspects and patients losing their identity because of what they do. The more they're off work, they kind of start getting lost and it just becomes, takes on its own, you know, a whole new life on its own, as we all know. Oh, yeah. So trying to get to there from the back portion of the spine is difficult to do because unlike the lumbar spine, there's a spinal cord here, okay? And the spinal cord is like brain tissue. It's not like the nerves that come off of it. Those are like your peripheral nerves, so they're a lot more resilient and you can move them out of the way and work around them without much difficulty. The spinal cord, you don't want to be moving that around. You don't want to be putting pressure on it. You don't want to be retracting it much for fear of neurologic deficits and problems, right? So you're very limited posteriorly on what you can do as far as getting to the disc because it's in front of the cord or under it. So how do you get to it? It's not real easy to do. So typically, done things from a front or an anterior approach, because you can get to where the problem is and clean out those nerve roots in the corners there. When you clean out the disc, you have an access and a good look at the nerve root trying to come out the side of the spine, which would be kind of where, the, where this probe is, okay? on each side, so I can clean all that information or that uh, disc material off those, off those nerves and get the nerves unpinched to relieve their symptoms that they're typically having, okay? So once the, once the disc material has been removed, this is the part we talked about, uh, we call iatrogenic instability, where because we've had to, to work on the spine and we've imparted instability, it means we've had to destabilize the spine, one, to clean out the problems that are causing the, the issues for the patient, but then we have to restabilize it because we, have, we can't leave the spine unstable afterwards, right? So there's different ways of accomplishing that. So with, an arf, with a, a fusion, what we're gonna do is put that spacer, similar to what was in the lumbar spine, it's basically a spacer that's filled with bone graft, and this is what it looks like. You have another one thing to pass around. Yeah. Take a look at what that is. So they're made of different uh, materials. Sometimes these are titanium coated, like a titanium coated polymer. Sometimes they're made of titanium completely with different versions of, of the implants. The idea of the spacer is when we put it in the spine, okay, we're gonna wedge this thing in there. Basically what it does, it basically produces a block to motion. Okay? But it also stabilizes that segment. Well, this is a model, it's all apart. So just to show what's gonna look like. So it goes where the disc used to be, okay? And the idea of that is it keeps the orientation of these bones. There's a plate that's gonna go on next. But that spacer keeps the orientation of the bones in that location and keeps the spacing of the bones more importantly. Because if we don't have anything in there and these two bones collapse on one another, the hole that the nerve comes out on the side closes down and clamps down on the nerve again so they end up with the same sort of problems they came in for. So this maintains that spatial relationship between the two vertebral bodies. small plate that I'm going to put on the front about the size of a postage stamp. That's for one level. There are two level plates. There's up to five level plates if you need to, depending on how many how many issues there are. If it's a patient with trauma, if they've got a diffuse disease like rheumatoid arthritis, let's say there's tumor involved or if it's infection, there's some instances where we have to do multiple extensive surgeries uh, based on their underlying diagnosis. Thankfully, that's pretty rare. Okay. How stable is that then if you have to use multiple? Multiple 
you said you're saying multiple. But you do multiple levels? Yeah. It's actually quite stable. Quite stable from the front with the plate, because the plate's a very rigid structure, and with the screws at each level, there's two screws at each level that you'll see here. Um, so you've got segmental fixation with a rigid plate that's, hold, that's basically attached to the level of the spine, so it's relatively, I mean, it's very stable, actually. You know, from the front, you really can't go below, like, I've gone down as low as T1, T2, which is kind of going down on the chest behind the sternum here. I mean, if you have to get further, further inferior to that for a reason, you know, you have to start taking out sternum and, and moving along out of the way. It's pretty extensive, but you can do six or seven levels in the front if needed. Typically, we stop at the last level between cervical seven and the last cervical vertebrae and the first thoracic of C7, T1. The patient I had to go to, to T1, T2 was a patient that had, uh, poor lady, uh, she had pretty bad burns um, in, in her 20s, and I mean, over the majority of her body, she was very prone to infections, and she had a very, very bad problem in her neck, which generation of spinal cord compression was losing the ability to walk. So we did a typical procedure like this as far as the anterior cervical discectomy infusion for on a couple levels, but sure enough, she got infected because she almost every time anything touches her body, she gets an infection. So we had to revise her and, and go back and take some bone from her hip and, and do the incision because her bones were kind of getting eaten away by the infection in a very quick fashion uh, to get enough bone to work with to restabilize her and take a big chunk of her hip and put it in her neck to stabilize her. So that, that typically she healed that. But it's just some of those things you gotta throw the punch as best you can. So we put the plate on the front, okay, and that stabilizes. Now you can see that that's not going anywhere, right? So this, and that's part of the problem, right? Because it's not moving at all. So now everything has to come below, the levels below and above to do all the work like you saw in the video as far as that's concerned, okay? So you guys can take a look at that. How long do you want someone to stop smoking before you'll do with the CDF? You know, I'd like them to stop smoking for about a month before they stop, just so they, they can prove that they've stopped smoking. You know, the reality is we, we get in tough situations where you have patients with pathology and they're smokers, but if they're losing function or logic, you don't really have a whole lot of choice. You kind of have to fix them so they can they can recover that function. And if they heal, they heal. Hopefully they do. And usually they do. You can use external bone stimulators to help. Um, but it's a risk we take. You know, and the patient has to know that, that there can be a decreased uh, incidence of healing or decreased risk of non 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 union infusion. You said do a test to for the test smoking, like to make sure they're No, we don't typically do, yeah. I mean, as far as like you know, a blood test or a volatile test or something like that. You know, I would tell you smoking does have an effect, but I, the reality is has it shown to be a, a, a large de a deficit as far as um, or significant impact on, on lack of healing. In my experience it hasn't been. That's because that, the technology that has improved so much now and the way we, we acknowledge that we have a fusion technology, particularly for fusions, um, we've, been able to, we've been able to augment that reaction for the fusion, fusion response based on the surface technology of the new implants that we have, um, new invasive techniques, being able to compare the bone a little bit better, and other implements we can use to help. And external bone stimulators are another one, another option. Uh, and that's a good question that comes up with fusion versus artificial disc. If you have a smoker, we're not worried about healing a fusion, right? So if they're a smoker, we're putting an artificial disc in, we're not worried about preventing a fusion. In fact, we don't want a fusion, right? So it's, it's not as much of an issue as far as the, the post-op recovery you're dealing. All right. So with an artificial disc, similar concept, we're going to go and clean out in between the discs, decompress those nerve roots, but instead of using that spacer on the plate, we're going to put an artificial disc in, and this is the implant device that it looks like. So these are the two end plates, the end plate on each side, and then the artificial or the bearing that's in the middle, it's like a little plastic mobile bearing that's able to maintain motion. So this basically takes the place of the spacer. Here's the pins here, we'll just do it like this. It's the same sort of thing. What we're doing is when we get this situated and we've sized it correctly, we're starting to tap this in, okay, and then we'll get an x-ray to see where it is and make sure it's in the right place. And typically it's an x-ray from the side and an x-ray from the, from the front to back as well. Mm -hmm. 
So you guys can take a look at what that looks like. If we pull out a move, it'll probably fall out, but it's just it's not being held in place by the normal tension of the, the soft tissue envelope. So and then that's it. So there's no plate to put on there, no screws. Just, but you gotta be really careful where you put that. So it really has to be placed nice and centered. It has to be deep enough, not too deep, because if it goes too far back, then the neck gets pushed into a kyphosis or a bent forward position, and it can't because the wedge is too far back. So you kind of have to get a feel for where that has to be in the patient's spine, based on the orientation, and also through, you know, having done them uh, as far as the, the uh, experience with it, okay? When new technology like this comes out, does the manufacturer come in and train you as a Absolutely. Surgeon? Yeah, so we're going to do this just like you're seeing today at the cadaver level, but we're going to be doing something different at the cadaver lab and do the posterior side of things. Um, you go through a cadaver lab and learn how to do it and the nuances, and basically have somebody instructing you that, that self developed the implant and has had experience putting in. You know, it's been on this IE study as far as getting it approved. All right. So the one's teaching you, so you can go through and they can go with those nuances and things to look out for. And a lot of these techniques and a lot of the, the skills associated with it, the things you already do for the fusion, it's just the implant you're putting in the, in the inner body space. Just have to be a little more finicky and, and, and make sure it's exactly where it needs to be. When you're putting a cage in there, if it's off a half million, it doesn't matter because the cage is just in the middle of the vertebral bodies and you're just looking for a fusion at that point. Anyways, the idea is that to have that just create that space and that, that distraction that it's supposed to have. So, but this is a little more um, detail oriented when it comes to that. They first came out with disc replacements a number of years ago, and there were a number of complications. One, they dissolved. Two, they fused on their own. I don't even remember what. How does this compare with the issues that were seen in the past? That's a great question. Most of that, most of that uh, investigation was done for the lumbar spine. Again, for the same reasons we're trying to minimize the fusions. Uh, there's typically a lot. It seems to be the, the consequences of fusing the lumbar spine because there's more weight going through the lower back. Uh, and more responsibility with activities because you use it pretty much for everything. Um, that's why they typically chose that route first to look at the artificial discs for the intervertebral space in the lumbar spine. What we found with that is, is twofold. One, the outcomes in the lumbar spine for pain relief uh, were really no different statistically from doing the fusion. And two, the incidence of severe complications. When I say severe, I'm talking death. Okay, in surgery was nearly what it was for heart surgery because it was going through the front, and what they were finding with the implant that was the first approved, which was the Charite disc, uh, it was dislodging or coming out because of the nature of this. It did, just, nothing was holding it in the disc space very well, so there was no teeth, really rough spots to it. There was nothing maintaining the positioning of the disc in the inter intervertebral space. So what they were finding is these were coming loose or dislodged and, and going out the front, because that's where you put them in from the front, kind of like what we saw here for the neck. And the problem with that was, in the neck, you know, there's your esophagus, your, your food pipe, obviously, and your, your windpipe, your trachea is there, but it's not a major vascular critical structure. In the, in the lower back, what's right in front there is your aorta and the inferior vena cava. It's particularly the inferior vena cava is a thin-walled, massive vein that brings all the blood back from your lower extremities up to your heart. If that extrudes and tears or lacerates that vessel, you're, you're dead with it in less than a minute because you just bleed out. So that, that was one issue, and two was if there was an issue with it, either became infected or they noticed it was dislodging or loosening or subsiding or having complications with healing in the right place. To go back in there to revise it was very dangerous because now you've got to operate in a, in a scar bed with those big vessels there that you're going to have to move out of the way because you've got to get behind them to get to that structure. And that was another reason patients were having severe, severe complications in surgery. So the, you know, the death rate for that was 1% in the early days, which is exceedingly, or 1%. That's not you know, patients with infections, patients with I mean, they, they passed away, you know, so that's, that's a big problem, obviously. Uh, so that was, it wasn't a very long time before people just stopped doing them. And I would tell you, based on technology, for the most part, you want things to be around for a, a year or two, um, as far as technology is concerned. If there's a little nuance changes to it, that's okay, but if it's a brand new concept technology, I personally don't like to be that first person putting it in my patients, because, you know, there's no tried and true effects. I don't like the guinea pig approach, and I just think there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work. And having done this for as long as we've been doing it now, you've been in practice 10, 15 years, you've been in training, and so you're talking about around this for 20 years, you start seeing a lot of these trends where there's this new stuff that comes out. Within a year, they're like, oh crap, look at all this that's going on, this is going wrong, this is going wrong. Perfect example is the artificial disc. I didn't put any of them there. Because I sat back and I said, you know, I'm gonna wait and see what happens, and sure enough, it got yanked. So it's just nobody does them anymore. Uh, so it's one of those things where you just gotta, you kind of have to walk the line of, you know, staying on the edge of technology, 
but not being on that front edge where your patients are at risk. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a sweet spot in there, so you kind of have to stay back a little bit, I think, make sure things are working out pretty well before you jump on the bandwagon. So it's, you just gotta know, know when that is. Um, the artificial disc, as far as the neck is concerned, there have been multiple versions of artificial discs. Typically problems with the artificial discs where they weren't seating real well or healing real well, or they were becoming loose because of the screw technology, the screws they were using to hold them in place. So as they've revised it and revised it and revised it and come out with newer versions of it and newer ways to maintain that artificial disc in the, in the disc space, it's becoming much more successful. Now with this implant, you know, it's almost unheard of for it to dislodge because it, the way it fits, the, the nature of the technology of the, the coating and the bone growing into it, it does quite well. So, and it's gotta be also the right patient, the right patient. What would be indications for a cervical disc versus a traditional fusion? So one of the main ones as far as a contraindication for it, so for a fusion, if somebody has arthritic, an arthritic neck with a lot of bone stirring, <coughs> collapse of the disc space, they're not a good, you know, arthritis in the back of the spine and the joints in the back, they're not a good candidate for an artificial disc. For a couple reasons, one, they have neck pain, you keep a painful segment moving, it's gonna continue to be painful. So those are patients you want, or you typically need a fusion. Um, because they're not going to do well with our artificial disc, and in fact, it can actually make the pain worse because it's now mobilized even more. Two is because they're already arthritic, and because you're trying to wedge this thing in there, and the bony work you have to do to get this implanted in those patients, they end up usually going out to the bone fusion anyways. So that patient will go, you'll, you'll follow them in the office, and in a period of two months, you'll start seeing bone bridging in front of the implant where it's basically fusing around the implant anyway. So you just did a, 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 a basically a fusion with an artificial disc, which is kind of pointless. Um, but typically, these, the best indication for, for this technology, younger patients typically, depends on their anatomy. So this, I don't tend to rely so much on chronology as far as, well, somebody who's 50, well, you guys have seen people who are 50 look like they're 20, and you've seen 50 people who look like they're 80. I mean, there's just, so everybody's a little different. You see patients come in, 80-year-old women who come in, you look at the MRI lumbar spine, and you're like, how old are you again? Because they look like they're 25, and every disc is perfect, there's no arthritis. I mean, it's pristine, and you're looking at this going, there's a big difference here when you see patients and, and their genetics, basically their genetic makeup. So you kind of have to fit the procedure, the right procedure to the right patient. So let's say you have a, let's say 65 year old patient or a 60 year old patient, but their discs are in great shape and they don't have any issues with that. They have a, they have a disc herniation causing a nerve problem. You do an artificial disc on it. It's a great option for them to maintain motion because they're going to be around in 20, 30 years probably, particularly with those genetics, right? So in younger patients, typically, if it's isolated disc herniations, that's when you do artificial discs. We're not doing it for degenerative problems. That's, that's when you start to push the envelope and start getting to be a little bit of a cowboy in the operating room, and I just don't think that helps the patient very well. Um, so it's not a real good option in that regard. The other time I'll use it is if we have, particularly if a patient has a degenerative spine and they have the level that's a problem, it's not a very degenerative issue, or they don't have any neck pain, it's a great option to try and minimize any further risks to those adjacent levels above and below so they don't get pushed over the edge like I talked about. So let's say, you know, it's a 55-year-old person, they have some diffuse degeneration, but the disc level that they have, the problem that doesn't have a lot of degeneration, but the levels above and below do, I'll do an artificial disc in that person, even though they have some more degenerative spine, but it's just not at that level. So I'm trying to maintain motion there so we don't put more stress on those other levels to push them over the edge to become a problem. So typically, younger patients, um, not a lot of arthritis or wear and tear going on the spine. <coughs> Typical patients that don't have neck pain, it's usually for isolated radicular or, or nerve pain type problems as artificial disc patients. Um, those are, and depending on their occupation as well too, it depends. So for instance, we did surgery on a UFC fighter recently. So he came in, young guy, disc herniations, arms numb, weakness in his triceps, but this guy's an extremely high level athlete. Don't really think it's a good idea to put an artificial disc in. And even though he's a young guy, just what he wanted to do I don't want an artificial disc because we don't know, we don't have studies to show what, it, what happens if you put somebody in a headlock or those types of positions they get into. So I told him the two options and I go, if it's me in your shoes, there's no question, I, I, I'd want a fusion because it's rock solid, it's not going anywhere, you can't hurt it. Does that make sense? But you can, you can cause issues potentially with an artificial disc, so that was kind of, a, kind of an outlier, but interesting, interesting case. When you do the artificial disc, do you remove any of the, you know, arthritis or spurring or, you know, you Hopefully they don't have a lot, or I wouldn't be doing the artificial disc in general. Um, if they do have, like, one side that has an issue, I will remove those bones first. One thing to remember, though, in surgery you learn is, well, you don't want, and for an artificial disc, we don't want bleeding bone. So bleeding bone tells the body there's a fracture there, and it's going to throw a bone down there to heal it because it thinks it's a broken bone. So in this surgery, we want to really minimize or avoid any bleeding bone. We just want to clean the surfaces, put the artificial disc in there, and let the body heal to it, but not create a, a fusion reaction or a healing response. 
So anytime we have to work, and if there is a bone spur and it's relatively normal spine, I'll use bone wax to really clog that into the bones and end up covering it over, almost like putting a paste on it. So it kind of deters the bone from wanting to, to create a fusion reaction there or deal with response. It actually works pretty well, pretty well. So we hope we don't have to use that that much. Any other questions? Will, that, uh, will the bearing in there last a lifetime or after X amount of years they're expecting it to be replaced or? You know, we have studies out there about 15 years in Europe right now, but we don't really put a lot of, uh, put a lot of stake in those because everything works great in Europe. Everything works great in Europe. Uh, it's like, this is the best thing, people are cured. It's the fountain of youth, you guys need to use this. It's like, okay. So you wait until studies get done here. So the latest studies we have here for this particular implant is five years. And we haven't seen much in the way of wear for it because we don't have a lot. It's not a lot of. It's not a joint that you're using like you would have. It's not a lot of weight bearing, not a lot of compressive and, and uh, a shearing forces on that bearing because there's not a lot of weight above the neck. So head's 14 pounds. So not much more than that, depending on who you are. <laughs> you got big heads. I mean, mine's on 20. Um, but so we haven't seen many problems with that in, in, in the interim. Uh, there is a metal metal version of this uh, that was out for a while. There is concerns about metal ion debris from metal and metal wearing. Um, there's been some concerns of that in, our, in uh, artificial hips and, and knees as well. Um, so they've kind of went back to the, using the, the metal and, and plastic. So we haven't seen any issues with the, the ions being in the bloodstream. 